Have you ever wondered why we call this function hyperbolic cosine e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2? What does that function have anything to do with the ordinary cosine function? And you could ask the same thing for hyperbolic sine, which is e to the x minus e to the negative x over 2. These definitions seem to be totally unrelated to the sine and cosine functions that we're familiar with. So for example, sine and cosine are both bounded functions and they're periodic, but the hyperbolic functions are unbounded and they're unperiodic or not periodic, whatever the word is. So what is the connection? Well, I remember when I first saw this in calculus, I was like, okay, well, cosine of zero is one and hyperbolic cosine of zero is one and sine of zero is zero and hyperbolic sine of zero is zero. And cosine and hyperbolic cosine are even functions and sine and hyperbolic sine are odd functions. So maybe there's some kind of connection there, but that certainly doesn't seem to be enough to call them hyperbolic sine and cosine. Well, then I learned the derivative rules for the hyperbolic functions and I noticed that, wow, yeah, these are very similar to the derivative rules for the ordinary trig functions. They're not exactly the same. A couple of them are off a little bit. So for example, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, whereas the derivative of hyperbolic cosine is positive hyperbolic sine. And this one is also off by a negative here. You kind of have a negative where you wouldn't expect it to be, but they're pretty similar. And this sort of satisfied my curiosity uh, that there's at least some sort of justification for why these are related to the ordinary trig functions. Well, there's a much deeper connection that I only realized several years later when I was in graduate school taking a complex analysis course. And what I discovered is that if we take, let's say cosine as our example, it turns out that hyperbolic cosine and ordinary cosine are sort of the same function. And you might think, how could that possibly be the case? And you think of even like the graph of hyperbolic cosine, it almost looks like a parabola, right? It has this, it's not a parabola, of course, but it kind of has that type of shape, whereas cosine is this, you know, periodic function. So how could there possibly be any sense in which they're the same function? Well, here's the idea. When we define cosine as a complex function, so here z is a complex number, we can actually write it in terms of exponential functions. Cosine of z is e to the iz plus e to the negative iz over two. Now in a minute, I'll explain why we can write it like this, but notice how this compares with the complex hyperbolic cosine function. Hyperbolic cosine of z is just e to the z plus e to the negative z over two. And it makes total sense why we define it like this. Remember that hyperbolic cosine of x was e to the x plus e to the negative x over two. And so we're really just using z's here instead of x's. We'll notice then that cosine of z is just hyperbolic cosine of iz, right? So if we just go up here and take these z's in this formula and replace them with the iz, we get this formula. So cosine of z is hyperbolic cosine of iz. And similarly, if we take these z's and replace them with iz, we end up getting this formula. So we also have hyperbolic cosine of z is cosine of iz. Now, what these equations here really mean, or what they imply, is that cosine and hyperbolic cosine are actually just the same function, except that their domains are rotated by 90 degrees. So how cosine looks on the imaginary axis, for example, is exactly how hyperbolic cosine looks on the real axis and vice versa. So they're essentially the same function, but with domains that are rotated by 90 degrees. And I'll show you a graph in just a minute. But first of all, why were we able to write cosine of Z like this in terms of exponentials? Well, this really comes from Euler's formula. Euler's formula says e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. But if you just replace the thetas with minus theta and use the fact that cosine of negative theta is just cosine of theta, so cosine is an even function, and sine of minus theta is minus sine of theta, we get a formula here for e to the minus i theta. If we add these two equations together, so we take basically this plus this, so do e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta, and then divide by two, well, the signs drop out here, and what we end up getting is just cosine of theta. So cosine of theta is e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over two. And then it turns out that although we might have seemed to be assuming that theta here was a real number, we can actually allow it to be a complex number. And we write cosine of z is e to the iz plus e to the minus iz over two. So that justifies why we are allowed to write cosine of z like this.
Now, there is another way that we can see why these equations down here should be true without having to resort to this definition of cosine. So we don't really need Euler's formula and so forth. And here's how. Well, if we look at the power series expansions for cosine of x and hyperbolic cosine of x, the so-called Maclaurin series, well, the one for cosine is familiar if you've taken a second or third semester of calculus. But what about this one? Well, notice it looks basically the same, only we don't have the minuses. Now, why do we not have the minuses? Well, it essentially comes down to the fact that the derivative of hyperbolic cosine is positive hyperbolic sine. And remember, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So if you take two derivatives of cosine, you get negative cosine. That's why you have a negative here. If you take two derivatives of hyperbolic cosine, though, you get positive hyperbolic cosine. But notice these power series expansions are very similar. Now also notice what happens if we complexify these. Well, if we write this in terms of z instead of x, so we're thinking of these inputs as being complex variables, notice what happens when you replace each of the z's in this formula with iz. Well, here you would get iz squared, but that's really i squared z squared, but i squared is negative one. That turns that negative into a positive. If you replace all these z's with iz's in this formula, you get this formula. And the same thing here, if you replace these z's with iz, you get this formula. So what we've really shown here is that cosine of iz is equal to hyperbolic cosine of z, and vice versa. So that's another way of showing why these are valid. Now at this point you might think, why don't I sh just show the graph of cosine of z and the graph of hyperbolic cosine of z and just show how their domains are rotated. Well, complex functions are notoriously difficult to visualize or to graph because their graphs really lie in four dimensional space you have a sort of two real dimensional input because a complex number is basically an ordered pair and then the output is an ordered pair. So you're kind of graphing from R2 to R2. So its graph lies in four dimensional space. So complex functions, even simple ones like Z squared are very difficult to visualize. But there are certain ways to visualize the graph. So for example, you could look at the real part or the imaginary part and those would be surfaces lying above the XY plane or you could look at the modulus of the function. And that's what we're gonna do here. So here's the graph of the modulus of cosine. So notice we have our x-axis, which is the real axis, the y-axis, the imaginary axis. This is the z-axis, not to be confused with our variable z. But here's the modulus of cosine z. So notice this kind of looks like the absolute value of cosine of z right here, right? Well, notice if we go in this direction though, what are we getting like along the imaginary axis? Well, it looks like hyperbolic cosine. In fact, this red graph here is the graph of hyperbolic cosine. Notice it's just the same graph, only rotated. Basically, the x and y axes have switched positions. So the graphs are basically the same with the exception of that 90 degree rotation. Now, I'm sure somebody's going to say, well, they're not really the same function. And of course, they're not exactly the same function. But I think a good analogy would be like the analogy between the ordinary sine and cosine functions. Notice these are obviously not the same function, but notice that you can get from one graph to the other just by shifting the domain by pi over two. And these graphs obviously look very, very similar, and we all know that, but I don't think it was clear at all that cosine and hyperbolic cosine should be so similar, that basically if you just rotate one, you get the other. That's the type of thing that only becomes clear when you move into the realm of complex numbers. It's not clear just looking at the graph of cosine and the graph of hyperbolic cosine from the real perspective. Finally, I wanna point out that we get a similar thing happening with sine and hyperbolic sine. So here's the complex sine function. So notice we have a negative in the numerator and we also have an i down here. But it turns out that it's not the case that sine of z equals hyperbolic sine of i z but we have an extra i out here. So it's i sine of z equals hyperbolic sine of i z. So what this tells us is that to get from one function to another, say hyperbolic sine to sine, we need to do a rotation of 90 degrees, not only in the domain, but also in the range. But again, we see this intimate connection between sine and hyperbolic sine that only is apparent now that we've moved into this realm of complex numbers.